Johann Mathis Martin Schippen was born in Brandenburg, Germany on the 15th of December 1850. In October 1853, the Schippen family boarded a ship docked at Hamburg, the vessel departing for Australia. Following a long voyage at sea, the Shippens arrived at Port Adelaide in South Australia in February 1854. Not much is known about Mathis's youth, however, before moving to Australia, it was said that his young brother was mauled to death by a wolf. After their arrival in Australia, his mother Anna passed away, and his father became an alcoholic. On the 23rd of July 1874, Mathis married Joanne Louise Elizabeth Don't in a chapel located in Eden Valley, South Australia. Joanne was born in Prussia on the 9th of April 1844 and relocated to Australia in 1854, originally settling in Victoria and later moved to the wine regions in the south of the country. Although many believed the couple to be German, they were actually of Wendish descent. This particular group were known to be fairly different to Germans, with their own language, customs and traditions. It was rumoured that those who identified as being Wendish dabbled in superstitions and witchcraft. However, those who accused them of this were God-fearing Lutherans. Mathis and Joanne became parents to seven children, several of which used different names from which they were given at birth. Pauline Augusta, born on the 1st of August 1875. Maria Augusta, known as Mary, born on the 10th of September 1877. Carl Frederick, known as Fritz Karl Martin, born on the 13th of May 1879. Heinrich Johann Gustav, known as Henry Harry Shepherd, born on the 1st of March 1881. August Wilhelm, known as Gustav, to his family, born on the 26th of May 1883. Wilhelm Johann Gottlieb, born on the 22nd of March 1886, and Joanne Elizabeth, known as Bertha, who was born on the 16th of January 1888. The Shippens lived in a self-built cottage in a small German farming settlement in the locality of Tewitta, near the town of Sedan. The family were rocked by scandal when, in 1896, Mathis found himself in an unwanted situation. He was on his way to collect two of his children from a neighbour's house when he was taunted by three young men, Carl Hartwig, his brother Herman and their friend William Radomi. Shippen had a rifle in his possession and the trio were urging him to shoot at them. One of the men began throwing stones at Mathis, who insisted that they stop attacking him. For people who knew Mathis Shippen, they were all aware of his authoritative ways and short temper. He was seen as being very strict with his children and could be easily angered. Therefore, the situation he found himself in that day would see him fall into a fit of rage, with dire consequences. The three men bolted towards Shippen and shoved him to the ground, which was the last straw. He fired a bullet into the ground as they darted away. The bullet ricocheted and struck Karl Hartwig in the calf. Hartwig survived his injuries, but Mathis was arrested by police. The case was ultimately thrown out by the prosecutor, with the judge giving him a stern warning that Hartwig could have been killed, which would have resulted in Shippen hanging at Adelaide Jail for the crime. Following this, Mathis was rarely seen wandering to Witta and chose to stay away from prying eyes. Mathis and Joanne's eldest daughter, Pauline, tragically passed away in 1899 due to tuberculosis. The family had endured a difficult couple of years, but with the new century approaching, they hoped that their futures would hold great things.
The patriarch of the family had seemingly turned his life around following the turn of the century, having cultivated 65 hectares of farmland, which included several farm buildings, a kitchen, garden and cottage. Because the original house was crumbling over the years, he constructed a new home for the family to live in, which included an underground dairy and two water tanks. Mathis, Joanne and their daughters shared the house while the sons stayed in a shed behind the dwelling. On the 27th of December 1901, Mathis and Joanne departed from Tuwita and travelled to visit relatives in Flaxman's Valley, leaving four of their children, Mary, Bertha, Gustav and Wilhelm, at the cottage. On New Year's Day 1902, brothers Wilhelm and Gustav took a hunting trip together in the hope of finding birds, rabbits and foxes to eat. They managed to shoot a couple of parrots and returned to the cottage at around lunchtime. Wilhelm plucked the feathers from the parrots and cleaned the carcasses, with Mary then placing the meat in a safe. The brothers then went to a friend's house nearby, leaving Mary and Bertha alone in the house, but at some point in the afternoon, Bertha left to play with some of her friends. As evening fell, Bertha returned home to aid her older sister with feeding and watering the animals on the farm. At 7pm, Mary and Bertha ate dinner. Bertha retired to bed for the night as Mary sat on the doorstep waiting for her brothers to come home. She didn't have to wait long as Gustav and Wilhelm made it home safely at approximately 8pm. After eating some cake, they went to bed in their shared outhouse, the siblings falling asleep with silence falling over the Tuwita house. Between 10pm and midnight, Mary was suddenly startled awake, feeling a heavy weight on top of her. Instinct kicked in and she screamed, only to be grabbed by both wrists and thrown across the room, hitting her head off a wall before landing on the floor. Bertha awoke to the commotion and both she and her sister yelled for their brother Gustav to come and help them. The intruder, who was reported to have been a male of similar height to Mary, had a gruff voice and ordered the sisters to shut up or I will kill you. He forced Mary to exit the bedroom and go to the kitchen, where Mary caught a glimpse of something in the coat of the man, and she heard the weapon clatter off the floor, assuming it to be a knife. Luckily, as the assailant was searching for the knife, Mary managed to escape the cottage, bolting towards the outhouse where once again she alerted her brother for help. Gustav initially didn't believe Mary's story, believing it to be some sort of practical joke. However, the ship and siblings froze when they heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the cottage. Gustav ran to a nearby farmstead to raise the alarm, whilst Mary and Wilhelm stayed in the outhouse, waiting for their brother to return. Gustav spoke to a neighbour whose name was Fred Henke, however he stated that there was simply nothing he could do to help, leaving the 18-year-old to quickly go back to the ship and residence. Before entering the kitchen door, which had been swung open, the trio each grabbed a pitchfork. Managing to find lights, they could clearly see pools of blood all over the kitchen. Witnessing the scene chilled them to the bone, leaving them trembling with fear. Too afraid to go deeper into the house, they all went to another farm close by, which belonged to the Lambert family, and was residence of the district constable Alfred Charles Lambert. Constable Lambert followed the Shippens to the cottage, stepping into the kitchen together. Lighting a lantern, they followed the blood trail. There were puddles of blood over the floor, spatters in the fireplace and on the couch and walls. Blood was also present on the beds, both in the girls' room as well as Mathis and Joanne's bedroom. The trail ended in this bedroom where the foursome witnessed a gruesome and heartbreaking scene. 13-year-old Bertha Shippen, still dressed in her nightclothes, lay in a pool of her own blood. Her face was buried beneath her arms with her legs outstretched. 
Bertha had been stabbed in the back of the neck, had a cut on her chin, gashes in both cheeks, bruises on her lower body, and her throat had been slit from ear to ear. The Adelaide Register, stating that her death had been almost instantaneous due to the severe wound to her carotid artery. The perpetrator had slit her throat from left to right and there was evidence that they had cut at her neck at least thrice. An autopsy confirmed that she had not been sexually assaulted. Two butcher knives which belonged to Mathis Shippen were found in the living room. One was bloodstained and confirmed by police as being the murder weapon. Alf Lambert took the Shippens under his wing and hurried them back to his house, leaving them in the care of his parents as he headed towards Truro Police Station to report the slaying and seek help. After hearing the devastating news, Mathis and Joanne rode back to Tawita and an inquest into the girl's death was opened. To confirm the identity of the deceased, Mathis Shippen identified the body as being that of his daughter Bertha, who would have turned 14 just a fortnight later. He told police that everybody were on good terms with each other and were a loving, close-knit family. He said that he had no suspicions about who murdered his youngest child. Bertha had also been Mathis's favourite child. She was described as an outgoing and friendly individual and was strong both mentally and physically. She had worked at a canning factory alongside her older sister and offered to help out on the farm whenever she could. An inquest into the youngster's death was temporarily put on hold until after Bertha's funeral. Because of the summer temperatures, a quick burial had to be carried out. With her loved ones present, Bertha was laid to rest on Friday the 3rd of January 1902 in Sedan Cemetery. Dr Ramsey Smith, who was the city coroner and head of the Department of Health, stated that he had examined some hair which was found at the crime scene. It appeared to have been ripped from the roots, and blood was found on both Bertha's body and Mary's clothes. Mary said she had helped her father slaughter a few sheep a couple of days earlier, which apparently explained the blood. Unfortunately, authorities were unable to confirm whether the blood belonged to a human or to sheep. Constable Alfred Lambert declared that there was no sign of disturbance in the Shippen home and there had not been any reports made to police about a stranger wandering in the night. The media swarmed into Tawita and were granted to take photographs of the family. Despite their grief and endless questions asked to them, the Shippen family answered every single one. Journalists, photographers and members of the public gathered around the property as the inquest took place in one of the outbuildings, everybody desperate to find out more information. The surrounding areas of Sedan and Angustin were packed with people who filled lodging houses to capacity as the story became a sensation in Australia. Gustav and Wilhelm were the first to make statements during the inquest, followed by the doctor who had conducted Bertha's post-mortem examination. Initially, whilst examining her body at the scene of the crime, Dr Steele had stated that there were pieces of clothing around the deceased, which was later found to have belonged to Mary. Mary had scratches on her arms, several bruises and a sore neck. The doctor couldn't find any evidence to suggest that she had suffered any injury to her neck, which was noted to have also been recently washed, a piece of evidence which many found to be suspicious. Joanne and Mathis were questioned, but as they had left the property in late December, there was not much they could offer in terms of information. On the 11th of January, Mary Shippen was then interviewed for over four hours, answering each question put forward to her. Mary made a surprising and scandalous confession that she had been in a secret relationship with a Tawita labourer named Gustav Nietzsche. Mary and Gustav had been lovers for approximately one year and it was revealed that Bertha was aware of their relationship. 
Nietzsche admitted during questioning that improper conduct had passed between himself and 24-year-old Mary, and the couple had engaged in sex at least three times with Bertha in the next room. He and Bertha got along very well, and Gustav even joked about taking Bertha to Adelaide with him. Mary and Gustav spent the evening of the 27th of December 1901 together at the house, just hours after Mathis and Joanne had departed for Flaxman's Valley. Police believed that the relationship could have been a motive for Gustav to kill Bertha, afraid that she would expose them. However, several witnesses were able to confirm that Nietzsche had been in Adelaide at the time of the murder. The jury at the inquest retired to consider the evidence at 5.55pm and returned at 7pm to deliver their verdict. Amos Baker, the foreman of the jury, had written the verdict, which was read out by the coroner after a lifetime of suspense. It stated... We, the jury, are all of opinion that Bertha Elizabeth Shippen met her death on the first night of January 1902 by having her throat cut by Mary Augusta Shippen. The Adelaide Journal described the aftermath of the verdict. It was received by the large number of spectators in complete silence, and Mary, who retained absolute composure, displayed great fortitude. The girl sat like a marble statue while the verdict was read. She flinched once, but her countenance set itself again, and then she appeared as calm and collected as when she gave her evidence. Mary was allowed to return home to collect a few clothes before being escorted by trap to Angiston for a night in a cell. Leaving her home at daybreak, she was said to have been pleading her innocence and weeping bitterly, her mother standing in the doorway and crying piteously in the arms of her husband. Mary Shippen was ushered onto two trains, then was driven to Adelaide Jail, and where she would be incarcerated whilst awaiting trial. The trial date was set for the 4th of March 1902. The case caused a frenzy in Adelaide, with crowds gathering in Victoria Square located near to the courthouse, and some even waited outside Adelaide Jail in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the accused. The case was adjourned until the next day, where Mary pleaded not guilty. Throughout the trial proceedings, the public supported Mary Shippen, however they painted Gustav Nietzsche as the true villain. The prosecution put forward the idea that the motive for the crime was likely jealousy. Either Mary was jealous of Nietzsche's affections for Bertha, or Nietzsche was fearful that his relationship with Mary would be exposed and ultimately ruin his reputation. The defence, led by Sir Josiah Simon, who was the best lawyer in the state, put forward their case over an entire day which described Mary as a woman of good character who would never cause harm to anyone. In doing this, however, the defence ridiculed Gustav Nietzsche, which fueled the fire of resentment towards him from the public. When leaving court, he was attacked twice and was forced to flee from the angry mob. On the sixth day, a verdict was reached after two hours of deliberation. Just after 8pm, the Crown asked jury foreman John Bradley whether Mary Shippen was guilty or not guilty of murder. There was a silent anticipation in the air as the crowd waited for their answer in the courtroom which was glowing in candlelight. Mary Shippen, who was accused of killing her sister, Bertha, was found not guilty. The crowd burst into an uproar of cheers as they celebrated the verdict they had hoped for. Mary was embraced by her parents and was then taken to a police vehicle outside which drove her away from the court. A small selection of people remained at the court, wishing to hurl abuse at Gustav Nietzsche, but police managed to divert them and let Nietzsche escape the mob towards safety. The family made their way back home to the Tawita cottage, which had been pristinely cleaned on Mathis's orders after his daughter was taken to jail. 
Sadly, life was never quite the same after the family's horrific ordeal. Locals continued to gossip about the tragedy that had befallen the Shippens, and there were rumours that the murderer was Mathis himself. He had apparently murdered a hawker, and Bertha threatened to tell the authorities. One of the two horses the family owned was wet with perspiration in the early hours following Bertha's murder, fueling speculation that Mathis had somehow snuck away from Flaxman's Valley and vigorously rode through the rugged terrain to kill Bertha in Towita, and returned to Flaxman's Valley undetected. There was no evidence, however, to solidify this theory, and it seemed unlikely that he could have travelled to and from Tuwita and Flaxman's Valley before dawn. Mary Shippen retreated from life in the public eye and became a recluse at the farm, the locals naming her the Grey Lady. In 1908, the Shippens left their abode in Tuwita and moved into a four-bedroom property at Light Pass in the Barossa Valley. On the 31st of May 1911, Mathis passed away aged 61, and it was rumoured that he confessed to the murder on his deathbed to a local pastor, and it was often said that Mary thought the killer resembled her father, however neither of these statements could ever be confirmed. Tragedy struck the family once more when, in 1917, Mary began to show symptoms of tuberculosis and subsequently moved to a consumptive home. Joanne left Light Pass to live with her son, Gustav, in Mount Mary. Mary's health rapidly deteriorated and, realising that she was on the brink of death, she took one last journey to visit her mother and brother. At the age of 41, Mary Shippen passed away with her loved ones by her side and was buried in Bower Cemetery. Joanne died on the 8th of September 1923 and Wilhelm, just like his older sister, passed away due to tuberculosis aged 42. There is no information regarding the fate of the remaining family members. As for Gustav Nietzsche, he struggled to live in southern Australia without being recognised by the public, who had seen his photograph in nationwide newspaper articles. He moved to another Australian state and changed his name to Gus Nichols in 1919. He married, had four children and died in 1954. The cottage where Bertha Shippen lost her life no longer stands, however, curious travellers continue to visit the location. It is a compelling yet harrowing case which has gripped the nation of Australia for over a century, with the assailant having never been identified. A life tragically cut short, Bertha Shippen never got to live a full, fulfilling life, but her memory remains in the hearts and minds of Australians to this day.